What's up, everybody? It's Boo from Mile High Distilling back here once more. We have a little bit of unfinished business. We have to finish our second part of our Distilling 101 series, Distillation. Now, a few things we didn't cover in episode one of this video. You can watch that video here. I always forget how this works. Might be here. Anyways, watch it if you want to catch up. But today, we're going to be talking about a few different things. I want to start this video off by talking about different types of stills to help you get a grasp on how many different stills there are out there, what they're kind of doing differently, and kind of getting you in the right direction of what you want. Let's start by talking about pot stills. For those who don't know what pot stills are, they are pretty much the simplest stills around, and their main purpose is developing flavor. There are a number of different styles of pot stills, but they all kind of follow the same ideology. We'll have a boiler, we'll have our pot still on top, and it's gonna go up through what's called the column part of the tower through a condenser line to condense the heavy, hot vapors into alcohol, and then we're done. Simple as that. So very simple design. Here's one of the designs that you can look for in a pot still. This is a very old design. Hence the name traditional. This is called the traditional pot still from us. And again, you're gonna see that process. Here's our boiler, imaginary boiler. We're gonna go up, through, and then into our condenser line until we come out the other end. It's got a thermometer in it, but other than that, there's really no bells and whistles to this. It's very simple in what it does. And again, we use those pot stills for developing flavor. Here's another type of pot still. You're gonna see some similarities. This one's going to just be longer, but it's gonna develop the same process where we have our imaginary boiler here. We're gonna shoot up that column and we're gonna go out our condensing line. So again, there's nothing much to it. The theory is, is that the longer your column is, the more it goes up, the more vapors have a chance to separate. So people traditionally make pot stills as small as they can, or I guess as short as they can. I think there is a little bit of truth to this, but I don't, think it'd be anything more than a marginal difference. I've ran towers that are 12 inches, a foot tall, all the way up to towers that are, you know, four feet tall. And I don't think I've really noticed that much of a difference in the amount of flavor coming out. It's marginal. And here in a little bit more of an advanced setup is going to be a thumper, which is a type of pot still, but it's doing something a bit different. So you're going to see here, these two pieces that I have might look pretty familiar because I just showed them. They're part of the traditional pot still, but we have what's called a thumper stem in the middle. And what happens here is this traditional head, we call it, is gonna hook on to an eight gallon or some sort of larger boiler. And then this stem is actually gonna slide into a smaller boiler. So we're gonna have two boilers, one below here on this traditional head, and then one below on this thumper stem actually inside. And what that is doing is basically we're distilling out through that head, but instead of going through a condenser line, we're actually gonna go all the way down through this dip tube and it's gonna hit that inner boiler. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna start boiling from there. So we're basically double boiling and in that process, in that second boil, we are cleaning, we're purifying things without losing too much flavor because we don't have a condenser to kind of strip our flavor or anything like that. It's still a short path system. So we're going to get our flavor, but we're also going to be able to purify, clean out that spirit a bit before it enters, uh, exits our condenser. Now right here, we're going to have a miniature version of what's called an Alembic still. This is an extremely old design. This design has been around for hundreds upon hundreds of years. Even ancient Egyptians use this design. In fact, Cleopatra was said to have had one of these. So it's been around a while. It's gotta be working, right? If it's been around that long. And again, you'll see just how simple the process is. It's doing the same thing, even though these components just look a little bit different. We're gonna have our main boiler where our solution's gonna sit. We're gonna be going through this head. Heads are gonna swirl around that vapor and increase that flavor of the overall vapor. That's one thing a little bit different in this unit. But from here, we're just dialing back things. We're going through, our vapors are pushing through, and this is our condenser. We're gonna see these coils all throughout this condenser line. And so 
That's how we're condensing. We're accomplishing the same thing, just in a different way. And that's kind of the theme with a lot of stills. We can build them hundreds of different ways. If you look back in history, some blueprints, some designs of stills, you might not even know what you're seeing, but one way or the other, these stills are doing the same process. They are distilling something out. What I have on my hand here might look a little bit different to you. Can you guys see what's different here? Let's play Dora the Explorer. Tell me, is this different? No. Is this different? No. This part, this is what makes it a reflux still. This is called a reflux condenser. And so now what's happening with the spirit, remember our imaginary boiler, we're gonna go up and we're gonna vaporize. We're gonna have all this steam pushing through, same as a pot still, but we have this chamber right here. So that vapor can't just push up and go through our final product condenser. It's first gonna hit this. And what does this do different? Well, when we cool this chamber, those vapors, they're gonna be heavy. Because they're so heavy, they have nowhere else to go but down. They're dropping and they drop through the end of the still so we can condense, so we can distill out that way. But when the vapors cool down from this point, again, they're too heavy, they have nowhere else to go but down, they go back into the boiler instead of just coming through. So in that process, we're gonna go back in the boiler. That boiler is going to boil and reheat that vapor. When it does that process, it's purifying it. It's taking out a lot of the impurities it's making it a lighter vapor, and lighter in distilling means higher purity, higher proof. So we'll reboil all those heavy impurities out, and when they come back up, this time when they hit that chamber, they are light enough to fully pass through, and they can continue down their channel. So in that sense, what's coming out of a unit like this is high purity with not a lot of flavor, because this process also strips a lot of the flavor. And once more, they make them in a variety of different systems. There are some that use different condenser types right here and right here. There are some that are much taller than this. Um, some that are even shorter, honestly, and still be effective. And some that are sectional, uh, broken into pieces. And you can basically keep adding to them to increase the purity. These are gonna be phenomenal for gins, vodkas, high proof moonshine, but one added thing, this does not mean all reflux designs are like that, but from ours specifically at Mile High, all our reflux stills double as pot stills. All you're gonna do there is just cut the water lines to this. This is a pipe within an outer jacket, so cutting the water lines isn't going to cause you to blow steam out of these holes on the condenser. It's just gonna continue on straight through, and without this chamber active, this is just a regular pot still. And right there are the two most common stills that you'll be seeing. In fact, 90% of people with stills, perhaps even a little bit higher, are gonna own one of these two types of stills. So wanted to go over it real quick. I do have a more extensive video on the subject if you wanna learn more about pot stills and reflux stills. Look in one of these corners. Once more, I don't really remember which one, but one of these corners is gonna have a video link for you to check out and learn more. However, we have a lot to cover. So for now, we'll just put it like this. Are you looking for flavor in your still? Well, then a pot still will do you. Are you looking for vodka, something high proof, neutral? Get a, get a reflux still. Are you looking to do a little bit of both? Like I said, that reflux still can generally do both. So that's kind of the route you should be taking. Now, once more on stills, before we continue with the next subject, I want to provide you guys a list of sort of some different stills you can check out. Most of these are variations of pot stills or reflux stills, different designs, different things that have made its way during the years or centuries, whatever it may be, just for your discretion. If at some point you wanna check out some of these stills, I'm gonna provide a list here. Just go ahead and Google any of the stills you see here to learn a little bit more. Now let's move on and start talking about some different pieces of equipment. Outside of that still, there's a few things we need, and there's also a few things we can add to that still to change our processes, deliver a better spirit, here and there, just a few different things. Now let's talk a little bit about another extremely important part of distilling, and that is your heat source. You're gonna need something to heat that still and actually boil the liquid inside of your boiler. This can be done a variety of different ways. Some of you might be familiar with what this is. In my right hand here, we're gonna have a control box 
which using this dial, we're able to precisely determine and change the temperature of our still depending on where that dial is. And this is the heating element that actually connects to this control box. This, not all stills are gonna have this, but some stills like ours are gonna have the ability for this probe right here to slide inside of the boiler, clamp down in place, and then we control from there. So this by far is probably my number one recommendation on a heat source. You get extremely precise control, and that is so big. When you're beginning to distill, I'd say probably the number one thing you're gonna find is temperature regulation, and a controller like this is going to make things so much easier to begin with. The downsides to this is this can't be dry fired, and this can't have any sort of particulate hit that element, or it's gonna burn to it, just like a coil on a stove. So if you're planning to work with solid fruits and solid grains inside your boiler, there are ways around this. You can get a bag full of your solids and just hoisting it above your still, kind of lock it in place through usually uh, where your boiler collar meets your still, and uh, kind of just hang it above that element so this won't touch it. There's also things known as grain guards. Those are little sleeves that kind of go over this element. They tend to hold the heat of the element inside, so it's not usually my number one recommendation, but it's possible. Or you can always just filter that mash out you're still gonna carry a lot of flavor over that way. And then you can post infuse. You can do different things to incorporate more of that solid flavor. On top of that, we could take a look at using just a regular hot plate. Everyone knows how these work. Just plug right in. That coil is gonna be where the base of your boiler sits. And then you'll just be able to control. You might notice this doesn't have as precise of a dial as our last controller, but you're able to somewhat control with that still. These do phase, whereas the controllers are constant current. So you'll probably find a thing with these where they kind of get up to temp, then shut down. You have to wait about five, 10 minutes for things to heat back up and so on the rest of your run. Kind of the same rules apply. This will burn and scorch anything left in the very base of your boiler. So you'll need a bag to kind of hold those things up. You'll need a false bottom, something that affect. There's also something known as an induction hot plate, which is very similar, but uses magnetism our boilers are too pure of a stainless steel content to actually be fully magnetic. What causes the magnetism from steel is something known as chromium, and lower grade stainless steel has more of a chromium alloy in it. Those are the ones that can stick. You might have a boiler that can use an induction ready to go. With ours, you'd need a heat disbursement or a heat diffuser plate. That's just a little plate that can kind of sit in the lip on the base of your boiler and then get down to your induction. We could also just go old school and use a propane stove. Propane stoves deliver a lot of heat. So even a small BTU stove can heat, you know, a 26 gallon boiler and below with relative ease fast. Again, the same rules apply. You don't have a whole lot of control with this propane. I do know beer brewers that have used a propane stove for 10 plus years. And of course they learn to kind of really steadily control that propane. But for beginners, not always the easiest thing. I will say those will obviously be a more cost-effective solution. Uh, running that propane compared to electricity, over time you might start paying a little bit more. Uh, I don't know how those checks and balances work, but propane's a very viable solution. One thing to mention as well is with propane, obviously all the outdoors for distilling. With any of these electric sources, you're welcome to do both inside and outside distilling. Other less common heating methods include heating bands. These are, you know, just little metal bands that can actually strap around the outside of your still, plug it on in, you start heating up externally. That will allow you to put, you know, those solid fruits and grains in your boiler without the risk of scorching. These can lead to tarnishing the outside of your can over time though. Aside from that, we also have steam. If you have a jacketed boiler, you can use steam to sort of heat up that outside jacket and then that'll heat your inner vessel where all your liquid will be. There's also oil. You can use a peanut oil, canola oil. I mean, really any cooking oil should work pretty effectively. It might get a little bit more dirty than uh, more premium oil, but it's acceptable. And if you were to use oil for your jacketed vessel, you still would probably need a something like that first one I showed you, that immersion heater 
to slide in that jacket and heat up that oil. My general rule of thumb is any still 10 gallons and below can use a 110 volt heat source pretty effectively. As far as the wattage goes on that, I'd recommend a 1000 to 1500 watt heat source for one to about five gallon or so. And then six to 10, I'd recommend going up 2000 watts. 2000 watts is a little bit of overkill on those machines, but I'd rather have it and not use it than need it and not have it. For 11 to 20 gallon stills, I recommend 110 volt with 4,000 watts. So you can accomplish that with one element or usually two 2,000 watt elements. You could also go to 220 for those sizes. For 21 to, I would say about 65, maybe 70 gallons, you are capable of heating up with a simple 220 volt, 5,500 watt element. They make 4,500 watts elements. Those would work, I'd say, from 21 to maybe 35, probably 45. Anything larger, I'd go up to the larger size element, the 5,500 watt. From 76 to, I'd say, maybe 100 or so gallons, I'd look at duplicating that. So we're going to use two heating elements at 5,500 watts apiece, 220 volt, to properly heat. Anything past that is really commercial level. That's when we start introducing three-phase power, which is gonna give us a wide range of different heating sources, heating sizes we can use effectively. Kind of find your range from there. If you have additional questions, you are always free to email us or call us. Down below in the description, we do have info with all our contact info. Now, another incredibly important part of distilling is we need a way to cool this still. We can't just heat up, because then all we have is vapor, steam. We need a way to condense that hot alcohol vapor back down into a liquid. So again, we can accomplish this a wide variety of ways. Unfortunately, I don't have any more props or toys here to show you, but let's describe a few solutions we can do. I would recommend watching the video uh, uh, here or here for this next part. We do have a pretty handy guide on some basic hose setups that you can use. The general rule of thumb is remember with any still that is available in the market, you will enter water from the bottom and you will push water out from the top. So just remember that. That goes for all your condenser lines, whether you have one, two, there's not really a reason you would, but if you have three, you'd follow the same guideline. So for pot still mode, where we have one condenser, remember water in from the very bottom port of our condenser and out from the top of our top port. With reflux stills, we can incorporate our water one of two ways. We can have one water line looped throughout both our condensers on that unit, or we can separate out those condenser lines, gain more control of the reflux condenser, and just separate everything out. The video that I just showed you up on that corner is going to have actual video of what I'm talking about, so consider watching it. But as a brief description, basically, one water line would consist of going in from the final product condenser, then out from the final product condenser, looped in to our reflux condenser, the bottom of it, and then we go out the top of our reflux condenser for our water out. Of course, separating out those two condenser lines would just consist of water in from both condensers and water out from both condensers. But aside from just water configuration, we also have to talk about what we're using as a water source. And really, the sky is kind of the limit there. We have a lot to choose from. We can do a really effective water recirculation chamber using a large bucket trash can full of ice and water and a pump. There's a video on that we also have in here somewhere. We can also just take a look at using somewhere around us where we're already pulling water from. An outside garden tap in our backyard. We can use a faucet adapter to pull from our sink or our bathtub. We can do it like the good old boys. Go down to the creek, pull from there. We can do a lot of different things. If the still is built right, which it absolutely should be, because I don't know if you could operate it without it being built right, your water shouldn't make any contact with your inner pipe that's housing all your alcohol vapors and, and your liquids and everything. It should just be a jacketed type condenser. So that's all that's really filling up with the water is just the jacket. That allows us to really use what we want. I still tell people to stay away from things like chlorine in their swimming pool. It could work, yes, but I think it would tarnish the metal over time and probably not very good for you. I mean, let's just use common sense here. So I'm not saying you have to use distilled water to pump through your still at all times to cool it, but 
I'd also just be wary of any water with chemicals or anything that could hurt not just us, but the still itself. Some of you guys have probably seen the stills we make and you realize that we make our stills incredibly modular. We prefer to build our stills in bits and pieces rather than just welding up one huge piece of pipe with a condenser attached because that's going to allow us to kind of play with the craft a little bit. There's a whole lot of add-ons that people can bring in and incorporate into their still and completely change its process. I've seen some incredible Frankenstein creations through things like sight glasses, we can add copper whiskey brandy helmets, we can add infusion baskets, plates to increase our ABV, we have gin baskets we can add, we have extensions we can add to increase our height, which in turn increases our ABV. There's a whole lot we can do with the still. Depending what still you have, not all of this will be possible. Things that are kind of built with one solid piece with a condenser line attached, not knocking by any means, but there's some things you're not gonna be able to do. For example, if you have a reflux still and it's one piece, remember that that reflux chamber is gonna strip all our flavor. So anything we have below that isn't really gonna do much. If we have a copper whiskey helmet connected to an infusion basket, then we go all the way up and hit our reflux. Well, what do you think is gonna happen to all that flavor you're grabbing from your bottom part? What happens with the reflux? It's gonna come up, take all that less pure vapor and knock back down. So all that flavor you just got in from the bottom of it is now kind of ineffective. Our pro models, which are very popular models here at Mile High, they have that reflux chamber on the units and then you'll see above that reflux chamber, we have a glass piece with a screen gasket. That is our infusion basket. If we're going to infuse in a reflux still, we want that infusion basket to be above our reflux. So keep that in mind when picking out your still. Keep in mind what you're looking to do with your still. That infusion basket, otherwise known as a gin basket, obviously is great if you're planning to make gins. Aside from that, if you're planning to make flavored anything, flavored shine, flavored whiskeys, brandies, flavored rums, it's a tremendous add-on. It's a wonderful add-on to have. And getting a still out the gate that has that capability or at least has the space to make that a possibility in the future is a really good idea. The good news is a lot of these other parts I've described can really be added into any still at any point in time. Things like extensions to increase your proof. You can really add a plate anywhere where there's a joint in the still. And copper whiskey helmets usually just go right near your boiler. So you know, just add that in and then put your tower on top of that. Think about those add-ons. Think about what you want your, your still to be able to do in the future and how much you are going to grow from your still. I know a lot of people like those really cheap setups on Amazon and they're great to learn, but it is kind of a hard thing when you spend that money, you're trying to learn on the still, you don't really have the full range of things you can do on a unit because it's not really modular. And then it either breaks or you don't really have the experimentation you wanted in the unit and have to go buy another one anyway. My philosophy, and not everyone is like me, but I want a still that can really do it all first go around. We have one more thing we have to talk about. I've got to give you guys some resources. There's an numerous amount of resources out regarding distilling. There is a bunch of wonderful sites, a bunch of awesome media and social media content you can you know, absorb. There's classes and other things available to get you started in the right direction. And let's talk about it all and uh, you guys can do your research as you see fit. Since it seems kind of fitting, let's go ahead and start with some awesome YouTube channels that you guys can check out. Most of you are probably aware of these. I would say number one is uh, probably us, right guys? But there's a few more we can check out. I'm just joking. We have Still in the Clear. We have Still It. We have Barley and Hops Brewing. We're gonna have Claw Hammer Supply. And we're gonna have Still Works and Brewing. Most of you are probably very familiar with Still It. He's probably the biggest distiller YouTuber out there. He does some absolutely awesome experimental recipes, different videos like that, which are so enjoyable to watch. Still Works and Brewing does some really good traditional recipes, tons of them out there. Everyone loves George Duncan from Barley and Hops. He just has some general knowledge on distilling. Clawhammer Supply has a good mix of both beer brewing and some moonshine, you know, spirits type content out there. And Still in the Clear is sort of just an all around as well. He does a little bit of everything, has some recipes in there, sells his own recipe kits, as well as just has some general knowledge for you guys. So there's a lot of great content on YouTube regarding this. 
If you guys are also on TikTok, a few shout outs to Prohibition1920 and Phil Billy Moonshine, both awesome TikTokers, in informational content, lots of playing around, short little videos. Now, if you just want to get on a website and sort of just start reading a few things on distilling, there's also some really good sources out there. You know I got to do it to you guys. We at our site, www.milehidistilling.com, have some awesome content. Look into our articles page. And we're going to have a bunch of pretty awesome articles, including full-on recipe guides and just some general knowledge on distilling, how-tos and guides like that. Big shout out to homedistiller.org. That is sort of like the wiki of home distillation, as well as their forums page. If you haven't already, definitely go to homedistiller.org, get signed up for their forums. That is a really awesome place for general questions, learn a lot more. Very unique people there, very helpful people there. It's a great recommendation. I'd also check out American Distilling Institute. They are really resourceful. They have so many resources out there for home distillers and commercial distillers alike. Tons of knowledge, a huge database. Um, you know, they work with a lot of guilds, distilling guilds. And this is probably for a select few people, but you could also take a look at ttb.gov. That's tango tango bravo.gov. They're sort of the rule makers of everything regarding distillation. Honestly, I know we're in kind of a gray area when it comes to this craft, but I found some really great information on that site. Just about, you know, not just laws. I don't really care about that too much. It's more just specifications of everything. You know, what constitutes a bourbon? Here's the grain bill. I mean, just some, some really good information regarding the technicalities of the spirits, I guess. Keep in mind that we also offer classes here. Now there are a few other classes that you can join. Uh, if you look up distilling classes, you'll find a few. Now not to knock anyone, but as far as pricing goes for some of those other classes, we're looking at a huge discount through a class with us. It does require you to fly into us. A lot of these other classes, it will be basically you pay for the plane ticket and you know that's part of the cost. But our class is gonna be very, very informative for the cost. You can find a link to the classes we offer down below. They're held at Downslope Distilling, which is a distillery that's been around for over a decade now at this point. They make some phenomenal spirits. They are very good at what they do. They keep things very scientific in their processes. And sure, I'm biased because I'm at mile high, so of course I'm going to favor the supplies and the classes we sell. But honestly, I'm not even saying this from an employee standpoint. If I were looking at a distilling class, what else is out there compared to what we have at the price we have it, I'd take it. We do have a two-day class that basically is all about the ins and outs of setting up a distillery. So it's going to go over guidelines, labeling, uh, different regulations and things like that. But then we also have a three-day hands-on workshop. From there, we're going to teach you how to make a rum, a gin, and your choice of a whiskey throughout those three days. They always fall on the weekend. They're pretty awesome. I would recommend if you're looking to learn more about this craft in general or anything regarding a distillery and setting things up, honest, just ask around at local distilleries, local craft distilleries. This community is pretty open, I've found. So just going around uh, to some local distilleries and asking for a tour, ask them about their process can help you learn quite a lot of information. On top of that, look at your local distilling guild. So anyways, I hope I've given you enough info to get started on the right track. I hope you're enjoying this series. I wish you luck on your distilling journey, folks, and I will see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.